tonight in the early sights. With elections set to kick off in hours, candidates prepare to take their shot at Modi's spot. A tense atmosphere shroud conflict ridden areas in the nation. 100 days to Paris. The Paris Games prepare to kick off as countdown begins. Venues speeding up preparations to welcome global athletes and spectators. Bobbing Rangers. Israel mulls over possible action to be taken against Iran strikes despite global leaders urging restraint. And Hopping Helper. Exploring the stars now becomes the job of one handy robot. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ala Verna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Vinuth Warnasuriya. Good evening and welcome to World News. Let's get you updated on the latest developments that occurred across the globe, starting off in neighboring India, where the election season is kicking off. Amid the thunder and fury in India, as the world's most populous nation heads to general election, the streets of Manipur, a violent stone state in the country's far east, are largely quiet despite being one of the regions to vote first. Take a look. The streets of Manipur, a tiny violent stone state in India's far east, are quiet despite the world's most populous nation heading to a general election. Its 3.6 million residents will be some of the first to vote in the seven-phase election on Friday, but campaigning is being held behind closed doors due to fears of violence. Conflict in the state first broke out over the potential extension of affirmative action rights available to the Kukis people, who form 16% of the state's population, to the dismay of the majority Métis, who make up 53%. Residents like Francis Kasham are disappointed in Prime Minister Narendra Modi's government over failure to end what critics have called a mix of anarchy and civil war. He lives in a refugee camp with his wife and two children, displaced by the conflict in which at least 220 people have been killed since May. The fighting between the Métis and the tribal Kukizo people divides the region into two enclaves, separated by a stretch of no man's land, monitored by federal paramilitary forces. Modi's government has blamed the unrest on a refugee influx caused by the 2021 coup in neighbouring Myanmar, and recently announced an end to a decades-old policy allowing free movement of people living along the 1,000-mile border. While opinion polls point to a win for Modi, critics say Manipur, governed by Modi's own BJP party, is a rare security and image failure for him. Despite the party and its ally holding the area's two seats, Manipur has little impact on national politics and the BJP's manifesto does not even mention the state. That hasn't stopped BJP candidate Thunal Jim Basanta Kumar getting out on the campaign trail. The candidate for the opposition Congress party and Gomcha Bimal Akoyjam is promising to remove the BJP. However, many people in Manipur say they will still vote for Modi and the BJP. Métis because they have got support from the BJP-led state government and Kukis because they expect the BJP to win power in New Delhi and will therefore be in a position to give them some relief. And now updates on the stabbing attacks in Australia. Sydney's Bondi Westfield Shopping Centre opened its doors once again for the first time since a man with a knife killed six people before police shot him. Residents could enter to pay their respects to the victims with stores remaining closed and a white floral tribute laid out on the second floor. Many wept as they walked through the halls, with advertisements on digital screens replaced by black ribbons. Police and his family said Saturday's attacker, 40-year-old Joel Kauchi, suffered from mental health issues. Meanwhile, the bishop who was stabbed at a Sydney church has said that he is recovering quickly and forgives his alleged attacker, calling for the community to remain calm. Japan and South Korea seem to be taking more steps to improve on unsteady partnerships as President Youth of South Korea held a conversation over phone with Japan's Prime Minister Kishida reportedly. The talks were related to the trilateral summit that the two nations had with the US recently. The move seems to bring the two countries closer despite North Korea's provocations. President Yoon song yeol and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida agreed to continue bolstering bilateral ties and expressed their desire for closer trilateral cooperation with the United States in a phone call late Wednesday. 
The presidential office said the two leaders held a 15-minute call suggested by Kishida following his state visit to Washington last week. Yoon highlighted the need for close cooperation among the three countries, including to maintain peace on the Korean Peninsula and in the Indo-Pacific region. Kishida, meanwhile, expressed his desire to continue deep in cooperation with Seoul as a partner based on the strong trilateral coordination and to address various international issues together. The three countries have recently been ramping up security cooperation following the Camp Davis summit hosted by President Joe Biden last year. The G7 meetings followed into the second day now. The talks which occurred on the sidelines of the meeting before the opening of the day's discussion centered less on Israel and leaned towards the tense Russia-Ukraine situation. And for more updates on this story, we have Adhidhira World News Special Correspondent Don Kaluarachi from London in the UK. Yes, Vinod. Italian Foreign Minister Antonio Tijani held two bilateral meetings with the British Foreign Secretary David Cameron and French Foreign Minister Stéphane Sejourne on the sidelines of the G7 summit of foreign ministers in Capri. The meeting preceded the morning session of the summit, which will focus on the current situation in the Red Sea. Meanwhile, the US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, called on all supporters of Ukraine to maximize their efforts against the Russian aggression as he met with the Ukrainian foreign minister, Dmitry Kaleva. Back to you, Vinod. Thank you, and that was Adhidhira Naval News Special Correspondent Don Kaluarachi from London in the UK. There's officially 100 days left to go before the Paris 2024 Olympics kick off. France and Tahiti are getting ready to welcome the world's best athletes in the biggest sporting event. Here's how the venues will look. From Versailles to the River Seine, the world's best athletes will have the chance to compete in some of the most iconic and historical locations throughout France and Tahiti during the 2024 Summer Olympics. Paris will have 15 competition venues and host 21 of the 32 Olympic sports. Let's take a closer look at what they will look like. On the River Seine, thousands of athletes will parade in boats for the opening ceremony on July 26. The Seine will also play host to swimmers during triathlon and open water swimming events. It's the first time the river has been deemed safe to swim in since Paris last hosted the Games 100 years ago in 1924. Across the river, the Grand Palais has been renovated to accommodate the fencing and taekwondo events. Beach volleyball competitions will be held on the Champ de Mars, the world-famous garden at the foot of the Eiffel Tower. The Place de la Concorde will host the more urban events, including freestyle BMX, skateboarding and breakdancing. For archery, cycling and athletics events, spectators will head to the Hotel des Invalides, which houses museums as well as the tomb of Napoleon Bonaparte. Outside of Paris, equestrian events will take place in the famous Versailles Gardens. Sailing events will be held in a brand new nautical centre in the southern city of Marseille. And in a nod to France's overseas territories, surfing events will take place in Teahopo, a village on the coast of Tahiti, an island in French Polynesia. The Olympics will bring together 10,500 Olympic athletes from 206 countries, while just weeks later, Paris will play host to 4,400 Paralympic athletes. Events will be watched by more than 13 million spectators and 4 billion television viewers across the world, totaling 100,000 hours of TV broadcasting. We're going for a short commercial break now. We'll be right back with key global updates. Stay tuned. Welcome back. And now we have updates on the Israel-Iran tensions. With Western nations pleading with Israel for restraint in its response to attacks from Iran, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said Israel would do everything necessary to defend itself. 
Western countries pleading for restraint have dispatched their top diplomats to Jerusalem. Denn Stärke hat Israel mit seinem Defensivsieg. German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock said Berlin stood in full solidarity with Israel, but warned the region must not, quote, step by step slide into a situation with a totally unpredictable outcome. UK Foreign Secretary David Cameron said he expected an Israeli response to Iran, hoping it would be limited. The Iranian attack on Saturday included cruise missiles, ballistic missiles and explosive drones. They were mostly shot down by Israel and its allies and caused no deaths. Iran said the bombardment was retaliation for a presumed Israeli strike that killed senior Iranian military figures in a diplomatic compound in Damascus earlier in April. Following the attack, Iran's foreign minister warned Israel against reprisals, saying, quote, it will definitely face a decisive and harsh response. Washington says it is planning to impose new sanctions targeting Iran's missile and drone programs in coming days and expects its allies will follow suit. EU leaders are due to discuss sanctions at a summit in Brussels, and sanctions are also on the agenda at G7 talks in Italy. Meanwhile, EU foreign policy chief Joseph Borrell said some EU member states have asked for sanctions against Iran to be expanded in response to Tehran's attack on Israel and the bloc's diplomatic service will begin working on the proposal. So for more on this story, we have Adhidhir Navalny special correspondent Panchali Ratnasekara from Helsinki in Finland. Yes, Vinod. Borrell was speaking after an emergency video conference of EU foreign ministers called to discuss the repercussion of the attack. He said the proposal would expand a sanctions regime that seeks to curb the supply of Iranian drones to Russia so that it would also include the provision of missiles and could also cover deliveries to projects in the Middle East. Germany, France and several other EU members have publicly begged such a proposal. On these lines, European Union leaders also discussed how to make the bloc's economy more competitive and dynamic to avoid being left behind by its global competitors at a special summit. Back to you, Vinod. Thank you. And that was Adhidhir Navalny special correspondent Panshali Ratnasekar from Helsinki in Finland. And on the road to the White House, we have some interesting poll numbers to report to you. Donald Trump leads Joe Biden among Hispanic voters in Texas ahead of the presidential election in November. The survey revealed that Trump holds a surprising 4 percentage point lead over Biden among Hispanics scoring 41% of the vote compared to the 37%. Support among Hispanic and Latino voters will be critical in November. Several critical swing states, including Florida, Arizona and Nevada, have sizable Latino populations and even small voting changes could hamper their chances of success. The poll revealed that Trump's lead in this demographic is due in part to his average among Hispanic born-again Christians, achieving 61% of their vote compared to 18% for Biden. Conversely, Hispanics who consider themselves to be non-religious are more than three times likely to vote for Biden, with 53% to 15% for Trump. Trump is also ahead among Hispanics without a four-year degree, securing 43% of their vote to 32% for Biden. However, among those with a four-year degree, 43% back Biden and 38% back Trump. Some updates on the turbulence over at Boeing as the company's safety culture and manufacturing quality both at the center of a full-blown crisis following a January media panel blowout faced scrutiny in the two Senate hearings. Current and former Boeing employees delivered stark warnings at two U.S. Senate hearings on Wednesday over safety culture and manufacturing quality at the plane maker. They've been under scrutiny since the door plug panel blew off an Alaska Airlines flight in January. Testimony at the U.S. Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations raised questions about missing records surrounding the panel. Former Boeing manager Ed Pearson said an internal whistleblower sent him records about the plug that he had turned over to the FBI. Boeing has said it believed that required documents detailing the removal of the door plug were never created. The hearings come amid a management shakeup at Boeing. U.S. regulators have put curbs on production, and in March, its deliveries fell by half. Also under the spotlight on Wednesday, two of Boeing's wide-body jets. 
Quality engineer Sam Salapur has claimed Boeing failed to adequately shim or use a thin piece of material to fill tiny gaps, an omission that could cause premature fatigue failure over time in some areas of the Boeing 787 Dreamliner. Salapur has said he was transferred off the 787 program over his questions. Boeing has challenged Salapur's claims against the 787 and 777, which fly internationally. On Monday, it said it had not found fatigue cracks on nearly 700 Dreamliner jets in service that have gone through heavy maintenance. In a statement on Wednesday, Boeing defended the plane's safety, noting that the global 787 fleet has safely transported more than 850 million passengers and the 777, 3.9 billion travelers. The FAA said in a statement that every aircraft flying complies with the regulator's airworthiness directives. Well, let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news right after this. Welcome back. The space exploration is getting a leg up tonight, literally. A group of researchers from Switzerland are designing a robot ideally suited for a moon or asteroid where there isn't enough gravity to drive on on the surface or enough atmosphere to fly. Well, that wraps up all the updates we have to report to you tonight in our bulletin. Join us again tomorrow for more stories across the globe. Until then, thank you and have a good night.